That's better. All right. Hi, my name is Tom Ellis. On behalf of the Capital District May Day Committee, I welcome you to the 2016 May Day celebration. We are today honored to have with us Jeff Halper, both a top-notch scholar and an activist, what I think is a tremendous combination. It is fitting that Jeff appears on the 130th anniversary of the first May Day in Chicago. Local labor organizers were later executed after being framed on terrorism charges when a bomb thrown by a still unknown person blew off in a crowd. These Haymarket martyrs experienced a late 1800s version of what Jeff will speak about here today. The sophisticated punishing and terrorizing of those who disagree with powerful corporate interests. Jeff was born in Minnesota in 1946 and earned a PhD in cultural and applied anthropology from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. He became involved in the civil rights and the anti-Vietnam War movements of the 1960s. Jeff emigrated to Israel in 1973. Much of his academic career has been spent at the Friends World College. He was the director of the Friends World College Middle East Center in Jerusalem. And when the Friends World College merged with Long Island University in 1991, he became its director of international academic operations and was promoted to the rank of associate professor. Jeff spent 10 years as a community volunteer in Jerusalem's inner city neighborhoods and was a founder of OHEL, O-H-E-L, a social, a social protest movement of working class Mizrahi Jews. He served as the chairman of the Israeli Association of Ethiopian Jews, having been active in championing the rights of Ethiopian Jews and in researching the history of the Jewish community in Ethiopia. Mr. Halbert co-founded the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions in 1997 to resist the Israeli government's policy of demolishing Palestinian homes in the occupied territories. According to the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, since 1967, nearly 50,000 Palestinian homes in the occupied territories have been destroyed by the Israeli military or civilian authorities. This averages up to about 1,000 per year. The International as the International Committee's coordinating director, Jeff has organized and led direct action in opposition to Israeli policies. He organizes Palestinians and internationals to help rebuild demolished Palestinian homes. Jeff has been arrested many times protesting the bulldozing of homes in a Palestinian neighborhood. Frequently, the International Committee gets a call from a Palestinian family informing it that bulldozers have arrived. The International Committee thereupon sends out an action alert in response to which activists from different groups turn out and engage in civil disobedience by standing up to the bulldozers. Jeff coined the term matrix of control, which is frequently used in the International Committee materials. This matrix, according to Mr. Halper, consists of a maze of laws, military orders, planning procedures, limitations on movement, Kafka-esque bureaucracy, settlements and infrastructure, augmented by prolonged and ceaseless low-intensity warfare that serves to perpetuate the occupation, to administer with a minimum of military presence, and ultimately to conceal it behind massive Israeli facts on the ground in a bland facade of proper administration. Embedded in the matrix, according to Mr. Halker, are Israeli's three policies of fragmentation, displacement, and appropriation. Mr. Halper declares that Israel has spread the myth throughout the Western world that it is a small Western democracy besieged by Arab Muslim terrorists, when in fact Israel is the mostly reprehensible party. Mr. Halper was arrested after sailing to Gaza in August 2008 with other peace activists from around the world. He was the only Israeli on the ship. In March 2010, Mr. Halper was a keynote speaker at Israeli Apartheid Week in Glasgow. Um, Halper's lecture was entitled, Israeli Apartheid, The Case for BDS, during which he described the way the, that Palestinians are warehoused in Gaza. Mr. Halper supports the boycotts, divestments, and sanctions movement, saying in a July 2013, 2013 article, 
that BDS has generated meaningful pressure on governments to justly resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Halper supports the academic boycott against Israel. Among Jeff's books are War Against the People, Israel, the Palestinians, and Global Pacification, published last year. We have copies of that downstairs that we will have for sale after tonight's uh, lecture. Second book, Obstacle to Peace, a reframing of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. An Israeli in Palestine, resisting dispossession, redeeming Israel, and between redemption and revival. The Jewish Yishov in Jerusalem in the 19th century. In his most recent book, Jeff asserts that the leaders of Israel do not want peace with the Palestinians and explains why this is so. I present to you Jeff Halper. No. Thank you for that minute by minute introduction. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm only 70, I would be here all night. Um, yeah, I'm Jeff Helper, the head of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. Um, and uh, it's really an honor to be here on May Day. It wasn't quite planned that way, but I'm glad it, it, it fell that way. The music was wonderful. You're always inspired by, uh, by working union music. Um, and in fact, the organization, I mean, I'm, I'm a part of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. I, I'm wearing two hats, which is good when you're bald. <laughs> um, and my presentation is going to combine them as well. One hat is the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. And we're working to try to end the Israeli occupation and bring about a just peace between Israelis and Palestinians that I'll talk about. But the other hat is, uh, and it's very appropriate for this, for this venue, uh, I'm one of the organizers of a movement called the People Yes Network. And uh, I, I, maybe we can talk about it afterwards a little bit more. But the idea is that, um, and I see it with Israel-Palestine. Israel-Palestine is an important issue. But it has global implications. That's what my book is about that in fact the occupation has occupied the military uh, weaponry, the tactics, the surveillance systems, the security systems are all, all uh, exported. You have Israeli um, uh, military and university projects here in, 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 in this area as well in your universities. Your police forces are being militarized. I mean, you can make uh, it, it easily uh, a connection between the Palestinians in Gaza and the working people in Troy. Working people in Troy, immigrants, poor people, peoples of color, and so on. It, it, they're very direct connections, actually, and not very, not very hard to, to, to find. So we have a saying in the Israeli peace movement that we're all Palestinians, by which, and we mean that, of course, in solidarity, but literally, you can say we're all Palestinians, all of us, because we're on the receiving end of Israeli military and security and policing technologies that have been developed on the Palestinians. And the Palestinians are really the guinea pigs. They're not the end users. You're the end users. Uh, and so the whole issue of Palestine, this is what I call global Palestine, is much bigger than simply that particular issue. And you can make that case for every issue. I mean, climate change, you know, is here, and you've got people involved with the Greens and so on in this community, but it's obviously a, a, a global issue. Um, the issues of working people all over the world, of capitalism, I'll talk about in a minute. You know, uh, every issue, third world debt, um, every issue has both its local and global implications. And I think, actually, one of the most damaging and destructive sayings of the 1990s, and you might have even had it on a bumper sticker on your, your own car, was, and you remember this, think global, act global. That was terrible. That was, ter not that you shouldn't act global, you should of course, but it's gotta be balanced by global work. 
Because if we think global and act local, who's acting globally? Well, you know who's acting globally, corporations and governments. So in other words, we've in a sense uh, retreated from that whole sphere of global organization, global action, global issues, tracing the, the links out, connecting the different issues. I mean, Greens, environmental people, don't talk to Palestine people. This, this, you know, this is unusual, maybe, although I, I guess the common thread here is, is unions and May Day and so on. But in fact, when I go out to speak, and there's thousands of activists in the, in the community, but the sliver interest in Israel-Palestine comes. And then you get women's issues, and you get, and you, get a, a, you know, all kinds of other issues, and each one has its little sliver, and very seldom do we ever combine and connect the dots. So, well, my other hat is what's called the People Yes Network, which I'm trying to organize with other activists around the world, what I call an infrastructure. Uh, and that is that the left does not have an infrastructure. We, uh, you know, we're a bunch of local groups. Once We have our own networks. I mean, the unions have their networks, and Israel-Palestine people have their networks, and if you go to a world social forum, a regional social forum, you see different, but the networks don't link up. And so there's very little global organization, global focus, global campaigning in an effective way. Um, so I'm trying to, uh, uh, to work on that issue, which fits very much into this kind of a, of a day. And I took the name, I'm the one that decided on the name, actually, the People Yes Network, coming from a poem by Carl Sandburg called The People Yes. Um, some of you might know it. That would be a wonderful poem to put to music, actually. Because uh, Carl Sandburg, you know, was the poet in the sense of the working classes, or one of the poets of the working classes in this country. And uh, he had a poem, an epic poem, uh, called The People Yes, that he wrote in 1936, among other poems. He had poems for Chicago, you know, his whole thrust was, and of course he was a very famous biographer of Abraham Lincoln, uh, but, you know, that it was the working people that built the world. Not the Napoleons and the Cleopatras and all the famous people that, you know, world history revolves around, but it was, it's the working people. And he, his poem is called The People, Yes, and I'll just read you just one little piece of it. It's a book. I'm not going to take all night, I promise. But just a little piece to give you the sense that I think it's, it's an appropriate kind of a bridge between the wonderful uh, and inspiring music we heard today and, the, uh, and my talk. So Carl Sandburg says, the people, yes, he invented that before Obama. The people, yes, the people will live on. The learning and blundering people will live on. They will be tricked and sold and sold again and go back to the nurturing earth for root holds. The people so particular in renewal and comeback, you can't laugh off their capacity to take it. The people, so often sleepy, weary, enigmatic, is a vast huddle with many units saying, I earn my living, I make enough to get by, and it takes all my time. If I had more time, I could do more for myself and maybe for others. I could read and study and talk things over and find out about things. It takes time. I wish I had the time. So, uh, uh, you know, th those words of Carl Sandburg and the music we've heard today and so on, uh, is really what I think is alive. And, uh, you know, and part of the problem is, I'll just mention this quickly, is that we haven't managed to pass this on to the young generation. I mean, if you look around, there's a few young people, but at my age, everybody's a young person. Um, but, you know, we have, and, and I'm not sure why, well, I know why, because of neoliberalism and, you know, and so on, but I think we have to, um, we have to begin to talk to young people. 
And one of the problems I think of, of and I talk to young activists, I work with young activists all over the world, and I find a common denominator that actually, I mean, the whole tenor of the music here and of the day was organized. That was the you know, solidarity, organization, that was, that was the message back when, uh, in the union days and the, uh, a few decades ago and before. Um, and then I remember that famous poster, remember the big fish made up of little fish eating, eating the smaller fish and, the, and the, the title was organized. If you want to become a big fish with the other big fish. Well, the young people today in my experience are not into organizing. They're much more anarchisty. You've got concepts like the popular struggle, grass, I mean, there's an interesting and important idea there. You look at the Occupy movement and so on, but it's not sustaining. And, uh, and people burn out. And I think young people often lack this global perspective. Because if you think about it, anybody under the age of 50 grew up under neoliberalism. That's when it, you know, neoliberalism came out, in the, especially with Reagan and Thatcher in the middle of the 70s. And it was very atomizing. It destroyed organization. It destroyed solidarity. You remember, I don't know if you know, uh, but Margaret Thatcher actually said, there is no such thing as society. I mean, that's an, you can look it up, it's an actual quote. We're simply a collection of individuals running around, and therefore the state has no responsibility for the well-being of, of its people because there are no people. There is no society. And this kind of a view of me first and, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, my space. I mean, Carl Sandberg's right, I wish I had time. I think young people today don't know it, but th what they would say is, I wish I had space. I wish I had the space to read. I wish I had the space to talk, to think, because their space is all taken up with all the toys and all the diversions and all the games and all the, uh, you know, the technologies. And I don't think that's by chance. So I think we have still, us uh, old folk, we still have an important message to young people about organizing and about solidarity and to try to recover, reclaim some of these ideas of before neoliberalism and to tell the young people that the neoliberal world that they're living in that they don't like really in a sense. The Occupy movement really struck a strong nerve with people, people know that, uh, as Carl Sandburg would say, that we're being sold out, that we're being cheated, and so on. They don't exactly know what to do about it. And I think there's a need for more of a global movement, and that's what the People Yes Network is partly about, with others to try to reclaim that and to try to reconnect with, with the young generation. So that's kind of uh, you know, some thoughts <laughs> for May Day. But in fact, you'll see that that's, that's really what we're doing, and I'll, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Um, but I'll, so in other words, what I'm, tr what I'm trying to do here is to say, yes, our local issues are important. I mean, the Israel-Palestine conflict is important for everybody. I mean, you can't get on an airplane with a tube of toothpaste today. So obviously, it's radiating out from this center of insecurity and violence uh, and so on, radiating out into the world, and it affects your lives. So there is no such thing as local, basically, today. Um, um, and so I'm trying to trace out the threads. So that's what I want to do. Start with the local, start with where we are in Israel-Palestine, and then go global uh, in, in, in a little bit of time. Then we'll have time to talk about it. But you can begin with the question, of course, again, why should you care about Israel, Palestine, and Troy? I mean, it's kind of far away. There's a million other issues that, that you could be thinking about. May Day, why Palestine on May Day, and so on. Um, and of course, the answer is, again, that this is really a, a part of a global uh, issue. It's not just a local spat between two peoples far away because there's a thousand of those. There's millions of those, probably. But rather, this is a conflict 
that really disrupts the entire international system. I mean, we're talking about a region of the world that's in a meltdown, but a very important geopolitical region of the world, the Middle East. It's got a lot of the world's energy resources, of course. Uh, it's a source of a tremendous amount of violence and militarism. Um, and Saudi Arabia, which ironically is the, is the mother of Al-Qaeda and ISIS that the United States is fighting, is also the, Amer the United, the, the America's largest uh, uh, customer of, of, of the military. It buys uh, six, seven, eight billion dollars a year in cutting edge American equipment that then it channels to ISIS and, and, and groups all over the world to, 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 uh, to disrupt and to undermine. Uh, Israel itself, I don't know if you've been, not everybody's into all the news. It's very, actually, it's not so easy to find news in this country, <laughs> I have to say. Um, there's a lot of chatter, but there's not so much news. But this week, I don't know if you know, but this week, you know, George Bush in 2008 uh, gave Israel $30 billion in cutting edge military equipment and arms over a 10 year period. $30 billion over between 2008 and 2018. Obama this week approved a $37 billion package of new arms for Israel over another 10, period, 10 year period from 2018 to 2028. Now you can imagine pouring $37 billion into a country the size of New Jersey in the most volatile part of the world. And you know what happened? I mean, some of you know. 83 senators, 83 senators, and I'm sure at least one, if not both of them, I'm sure both of yours uh, were, were a part of them. 83 senators sent a letter to, to Obama saying $37 billion is not enough. We demand that Israel be given $45 billion in arms. Can you imagine what you could do, talk about working people and infrastructure and so on, what you could do in this country with $45 billion, you know, dedicated to, to the people's needs. So this is a conflict that on the one hand, uh, introduces militarism and polarization in the world and insecurity and generates conflicts. On a second hand, you might say, it's a conflict that, um, uh, in which the United States is tremendously involved and not on the right side of history and on both sides. I mean, arming Saudi Arabia and arming Israel. And on a third side, if you will, uh, this is a conflict that tremendously isolates the United States. I don't think Americans are aware of this. But in the world, the United States is kind of a bubble. You guys live in a bubble. You run the, it's a bubble that runs the world. That's kind of an interesting concept. I'm not sure how it happens, but I'm sure we can figure it out in short time. But it's a bubble because in the rest of the world, one of the becauses is, in the rest of the world, the whole concept of human rights has become really crucial. The human rights is important for workers and poor people and others as, as any kind of economic rights. Human rights is, is the language today, especially of marginalized people. That you have human rights, it gives you some, some leverage, some protection, some recognition. And, uh, and the United States, in its support for Israel against the Palestinians. And the Palestinians aren't only the Palestinians. I would say for the, the oppressed peoples of the world, and you can count about at least two thirds of humanity in that category of oppressed peoples, but also peoples beyond the oppressed. Uh, peoples that, that identify with the struggles of oppressed people. For them, the Palestinians are emblematic. Palestinians represent this little people with no army, with no, you know, 
being completely dominated, oppressed, occupied, killed, not only by Israel, but by the United States. I'm telling you, in the world, including in Europe, the occupation of 50 years of the Palestinians is not seen as an Israeli occupation. It's seen as an American Israeli occupation. It's clear Israel couldn't sustain it for a month without the political and military and financial support it gets from the United States. And from Congress, almost unanimously, Hillary Clinton at the top of the totem pole. So that this is a conflict that in many ways is an American conflict. And, uh, and I think it's, it's, it, it could serve as kind of a mirror to hold up to the American public to see how you look in the world and what you're doing in the world and what the implications of, uh, of what you're doing in the world uh, comes out of this. So it's a very important conflict in a symbolic way, not only in a practical way to deal with. And just really quickly, because I know you're not all wonks of the Middle East, um, you know, this is a map of what we call the two-state solution. I mean, for all the, the, the conflicts I'm talking about and the, and the disruptive power of the Israel-Palestine conflict, it actually has a simple agreed-upon solution. And that's what we call the two-state solution. The, and this has been the solution of the international community, including the United States, that's sort of a part of the international community, uh, since 1967 since the occupation began with the Six-Day War. And that is that there's one country here, uh, there's one country uh, that the Jews call the land of Israel, the Palestinians call Palestine, religious people call it the Holy Land. Whatever you call it, it's one integral country between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. And in this country, there are two peoples living that both claim rights of self-determination, Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews. So the question is, how do we find a way to live together and to resolve this conflict? And the two-state solution was sort of the Solomon's solution, cut the baby in half. Not exactly in half, as you can see, because according to the two-state solution, Israel in beige remains on 78% of the country. And the Palestinians, if they got every square inch of the occupied territory, which is the West Bank, it's the West Bank of the Jordan River, East Jerusalem, including the Old City, and Gaza, if they got every inch of that territory that was taken in 67, they would only have 22% of the country. So the two-state solutions, you know, supposes two states, one on 78% and one on 22%, that was nevertheless accepted by the Palestinians. 30 years ago, in 1988, in Algiers, publicly, the PLO under Yasser Arafat accepted the two-state solution. And this is unprecedented in history that a colonized people would give up political claim to 78% of their country. I mean, would you give uh, California and Texas back to Mexico? Yeah. Texas, maybe. <laughs> I'm not so sure. All right, Texas, we don't have much of an argument. California, I'm not so sure. <laughs> yeah, Arizona, you can throw in. <laughs> but, you know, but that's what the Palestinians did. Uh, and, and rather than getting uh, 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 credit for bending over more than backwards to find peace with Israel, uh, they've been demonized as terrorists, they're the problem, they're intransigent, Israel wants peace, and so on. And what makes it even more unfair, not only were they willing to accept 22% of the country, but they're the majority population and the indigenous population. In 1947, they owned, the Palestinians owned 97% of this country. And, the, and not only are, the, are they the indigenous people, today they're half the population of this country. 
And within five years, they'll be the majority. And that's even before five million refugees living around. And you know the terrible conditions of refugees, some of which are fleeing into Europe now from Syria, Palestinians are in. So there'll be a Palestinian majority, and yet the majority population has said to Israel, we will make peace with you for less than a quarter of the land. Whoa, we talk about a generous offer. And this has been accepted not just by the Palestinians, by the United States, by the international community. It's been accepted by the Arab League unanimously. In 2002, the Arab League accepted what's called the Arab Peace Initiative. By everybody except one party is a holdout, Israel. Israel says no, no. Because Israel wants 100%, it wants the whole country. You see, and if you can have 100%, why should you settle on 78%? So that Israel denies there is an, even is an occupation. Israel says there's no such thing as a Palestinian. They don't exist as a people. There's a bunch of Arabs running around. We see them with kafiyas, but they don't add up to a people with rights of self-determination like us. There's no such thing as occupation, because this is our country. This is the land of Israel. How can you occupy your own country? And there's no such thing as the West Bank. In Israel, we call it Judea and Samaria, the biblical term. So that there is no, I mean, in a sense, Palestinians have been erased. Their presence, their history, their rights, their claims. And so Israel says, we want this entire country. And it's not enough to assert that, of course, but what Israel has done over the years, and Tom mentioned the matrix of control idea that I developed, I tried to, to conceive of how you would frame this. Um, uh, a matrix of control means that Israel does not, you know, an occupation is defined in international law as a temporary military situation. Well, Israel wants this to be permanent. There isn't an occupation. So how do we make this permanent? Well, you create facts on the ground. That's the word we use. That are so massive and so permanent that they, they prejudice any negotiations. When you come to negotiate, Israel says, yes, we'll negotiate with the Palestinians, but only if we win. We're not going to go into negotiations and lose. And so you win by creating these massive facts on the ground that, that before you get to negotiations have already determined who owns the land and, who's, and who controls. It's the matrix of control. And really just briefly, uh, the Palestinians have been confined to these brownish areas. The darker brown are called area A and the lighter brown are area B that are a little bit run by the Palestinian Authority of, of Mahmoud Abbas, or Abu Mazen, we call him, but not really, because Israel invades at will. But on paper, these brown areas are supposed to be Palestinian. They only make up 38% of the West Bank. And then, of course, you have Gaza, which is a cage. People can't enter Gaza, they can't leave Gaza, there's no more agriculture, you can't fish, the water is gone. It really literally is the world's largest prison. So if you take not only, uh, uh, not only um, are the Palestinians the majority of the population of the country that want only 22% for a state of their own, but they're locked, 90% of them are locked in to areas A, B, and Gaza which means the Palestinians, in fact, are the majority population of the country, but they're locked into cells on 10% of the land of the country. So that area A and B, in another way to put it, and, and Gaza are 40% of 22% of the country. And then locked into more than 70 little islands which means that all the gray area around, 
and the pinkish, see these blue dots all over are Israeli settlements. They're in area C, which is completely, the 62% of the West Bank completely controlled by Israel, plus East Jerusalem, the Palestinian side of the city that's, that was annexed to Israel 50 years ago. It doesn't exist anymore as a Palestinian side of the city. But area C, where the settlements are, um, has really de facto become a part of Israel. Israel's on the way to annexing that as well. So there are 600,000 Israelis living in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, in the occupied territory, in more than 200 settlements. So the idea that somehow you're going to disconnect the West Bank from Israel and create a, a two-state solution is ridiculous. It's gone, it's over, there is no two-state solution. And just in case you still didn't get the message, Israel built a wall, a wall, and you can see the way the wall snakes through Palestine. It's not on the border, this is the border. So if it was genuinely a security barrier, which is how Israel sells it, against terrorism, all right, it was on the border. I mean, you can build a wall on the border of Mexico. I mean, the whole argument, should you or not, is a policy argument. But you can do it as long as you don't build the wall inside Mexico. You can do anything you want to on your border. But here it's a whole different issue because it's not really for security. It's for making the Bantu stands, making these prison cells of Palestinians permanent, literally building a prison. So you can see the wall goes way into the west. I mean, it has nothing to do with the border. These pink areas are the big settlements that Israel has. So you can see when the wall comes down like this, it hits the settlement block and goes around. You can't tell me the wall comes to here for security reasons. It's clear that on the one hand, it's a land grab, and on the other hand, then you create these cells, or Israel calls them cantons, in which the Palestinians are confined forever, imprisoned. A, a, a canton in the north, a small canton in the center, with Jericho kind of hanging out there somewhere, a small canton in the south, all surrounded by a wall, and Gaza, which is also walled in. And it's not just a wall. You know, uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, the, one of the big issues in the world was the Berlin Wall. Even Reagan went to the Berlin Wall, and so did Johnson. And they said, Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this evil wall. Israel's built a wall more than twice as high as the Berlin Wall was. The Berlin Wall was 12 feet high. Roughly, you know, the balcony, up to the balcony in the back here. The Israeli wall is 26 feet high, which is probably up to the, more than to the ceiling. 26 feet high, and it's five times longer than the Berlin Wall was. In this little tiny area of the West Bank, and not only that, but the Berlin Wall was linear. You know, it cut through Germany. This wall encompasses thousands of Palestinians in little islands and enclaves and cells where tens of thousands of people are, are literally locked in to, uh, to, to their areas. So, to resolve this conflict that really again is affecting the United States and the rest of the world, it seems to me that there are three options, three ways out. Um, one is the two-state solution. This could have worked, but it's over, it's gone. It's buried under the settlements, under the facts on the ground, and there's no international will to force Israel out. Israel only cares, Israel's, a okay. So option two is apartheid, imprisonment. Take the Palestinians and imprison them in areas A and B in Gaza, permanently. And it's even worse than apartheid in South Africa. Because, I mean, it's hard to say something positive about apartheid. But at least in apartheid, you had lip service. You had the pretense of somehow black Africans should have their own little countries, Bantustans. It was fakey, but, but 
At least they said that. Israel says there aren't any Palestinians. They don't even get a banter stand. They're going to be imprisoned in these cells, and we're building a huge prison. Uh, and we can sustain this. This is the point. Israel says we can sustain this apartheid imprisonment unlike South Africa because we have international support. Um, you know, and just look at Hillary Clinton and Cruz or any of them, and you can see that. I mean, this is, I mean, this, except for Bernie Sanders, this is like a consensus um, in both parties. So for Israel, the whole world boils down to two actors that are most important. One is the American Congress. If it has the American Congress in its pocket, it can thumb its nose at the administration. It doesn't care about Kerry. Even Bush was humiliated. It was probably, I don't know, he and Obama are, are tied for the most pro-Israel presidents. They were both humiliated. Uh, by Israel constantly because Israel, and you can see that when Netanyahu went to Congress against the Iran deal, invited by Boehner and the Republicans, you get a foreign, a foreign head of state invited into the American Congress to talk about, to, to, uh, to oppose a policy of the, of the American government. So when there's a fight between an American president and a foreign head of state, who's an Israeli, Netanyahu, Congress supports Netanyahu. Not only against its own president, the Democrats support Netanyahu against the president of their own party. I mean, that's how deep Israel is in the American political system. And of course, the other political actor is Germany that keeps Europe in line. As long as Israel has Congress and Germany, it's home free. Nobody can touch it, nobody can sanction it, and it can, do, it can impose an apartheid regime. So that this is possible in this world because of the Congress of the world's greatest democracy. So let's put that in our pipes and see what, see what kind of smoke comes out. So this is option two. This is what we have. We have a new apartheid regime in the world, Israel over Palestine, and no less, if we're in a church, no less than in the Holy Land, which kind of adds a little bit of irony to the whole thing. So what's the way out? Well, what we're advocating for is one binational democratic state. In other words, and this shouldn't be such a, a revolutionary idea for Americans, if, in fact, the two-state solution is gone, and we have apartheid today, what we have to say to Israel is this, okay, Israel, okay, you eliminated the two-state solution. You created one state, one country in this whole area. You created this. Okay, we accept that. You, there is today one state in Israel-Palestine, but, it cannot be an apartheid state, obviously. That's unacceptable. So you, we have to take that one state that you, Israel, created and turn it into a democratic state of equal rights for all its citizens. Now why should that even be a controversial solution for Americans and Congress? I don't know. You guys have been going all over the world for the last uh, century, you know, bringing freedom and democracy and, and militarism and neo-colonialism to the world in the name of bringing freedom and democracy. Well, here's the people, the Palestinians, who are saying to you, you know what, we'd like a little freedom and democracy, please. That would be very nice. And here the United States is saying no. We're supporting the oppressors, we're supporting the occupation, we're denying your rights, and like I said, that has global echoes. So when you go to the United Nations and there's repeated votes of the entire world, including Europe, the entire world against the United States, Israel, and Micronesia, whoa, you've got, there's got to be some warning lights here. 
in terms of the isolation that America is going into. And it's not only on Israel-Palestine. This American-Israel block has to do with arms control, cluster bombs, um, human rights in general. So the United States is coming out to be the enemy of human rights and of freedom for peoples all over the world. That is the image of the United States in the world. And it has a lot to do with the American uh, policy in terms of Israel-Palestine. Now, let me go on. Let me go on for another couple minutes because, okay, that's my issue. I mean, I don't expect you guys to liberate Palestine from Troy. Um, although, to be active in this issue is, is, is great. But at the same time, again, this is an issue um, that has to do with Troy, has to do with workers, certainly, uh, has to do with, with the lives of all of us. And that is that, that one of the questions I ask I ask in the book, uh, is uh, how does Israel get away with this? How can, well, how can you explain the support of Congress and the American government? And the usual explanations didn't really work. Uh, AIPAC, the Israeli lobby in Washington, is powerful, okay, but I don't think AIPAC runs, runs the country. In fact, the American defense industry you take Boeing and Lockheed and Northrop Grumman and the other ones, have, lobby, have seven times more money for lobbyists than APAC does. So if you really want to know who the big pro-Israel lobby is in Congress, it's the defense cor corporations, not, not APAC. Okay. Uh, you know, Christian fundamentalists, Christian Zionists as they call themselves, Sarah Palin, Pat Robertson, Huckabee, they call themselves Christian Zionists. I mean, that's how much Zionism in this, and this issue of Israel has penetrated into the American culture, into the American political scene. Um, you know, Sarah Palin, I don't know if you remember this, but I'm sure there's pictures on the internet, when she was governor of, of, of Alaska, and Alaska's got like six Jews. I mean, she's not like the governor of New York. <laughs> It was like northern exposure, you know. At her desk in the governor's mansion in Juneau, her desk was flanked on the one side uh, by an American flag and the other side by, um, by the Israeli flag. An Israeli flag in the state house in Alaska. So that this whole issue of Christian Zionism has gotten deep, deep, deep into American culture, and I think Hillary Clinton is, a, is, I mean, a little bit of a different take on it, but in a sense is partly an expression of that as well. That Israel's become as American as apple pie. Well, you got that, okay. But still, Christian, but that doesn't explain why Europe supports Israel, why China supports Israel. You don't have Christian fundamentalists there. You don't have Christian, you don't have Jews in India. That's become very pro-Israel over the last decade. And the other thing, of course, is, well, guilt over the Holocaust. Well, that works in Germany, certainly, but it doesn't really work here. I don't think young people even know there was a Holocaust in this country. Um, it certainly doesn't work in other parts of the world. So those explanations didn't do it for me. So I started to say, what's the elephant in the room that can explain why Israel gets the international support it gets? I'll give you one little example what's called the OECD, which is the organization of the most advanced economies in the world. 25 of the most advanced economies, including the United States, of course, and Europe and Scandinavia, the most advanced in Japan and so on, uh, about three years ago uh, voted Israel in as a member of this exclusive club. And according to the rules of the OECD, it has to be unanimous. So here are 25 of the richest countries in the world. So you have to assume they have among the most educated populations in the world. And they're among the most liberal countries. It's certainly the Scandinavian countries talk about human rights all the time. And unanimously, 
they voted Israel into the OECD. Even though the rules of the OECD say that a country has to conform to human rights before it can, it can join. So the degree to which countries are willing to overlook what Israel's doing to the Palestinians um, really shows that something deeper is happening. And I was asking what? What explains that? And it seemed to me more and more that the big resource of Israel, in other words, what's the quid pro quo? What's Israel offering elites and governments all over the world that can account for that support? And it seems to me the answer is the military and security and policing. So when you look at a map of Israel's, so I started instead of looking down at the occupation of the Palestinians, I started to look up at Israel's place in the world and whoa, all of a sudden you find a whole different reality. Israel, which again is the size of New Jersey, um, turns out to be the fourth, fifth, sixth largest arms exporter in the world. It's the fourth largest nuclear power, tied with France. It's, it's the fourth, fifth, sixth largest arms exporter, tied with France roughly. Israel exports more arms than Britain or China. And everywhere. Now, you, I would argue, that people think I'm crazy, but that's not news. I would argue that Israel has more global reach in terms of military security and policing than the United States does. Because the United States has 174 bases in the world. And you guys are out there. But they're military bases. So you know, they're, they're confined to McDonald's land, then the pilots fly up and down, and they go out in their ships, and they do this and they do that. But the impact on the local society is fairly limited. Israel doesn't have bases, but it's everywhere. And it's not only training your military from the United States down to Equatorial Guiana, but it's training your special operations forces and your, and, and your elite units um, and so on. But Israel is also involved in the Presidential Guard, in homeland security, in working with the FBI, down to police forces. I mean, we know Ferguson. I mean, you know, and it was amazing with Ferguson, if you, I'm sure you know this, but when the attack on the Ferguson people happened by the police, um, Palestinians in Gaza were SMSing the people of Ferguson telling them how to deal with tear gas and how to deal with the police. I mean, immediately this tie was, was, was formed between the people of Ferguson and, and the people of Gaza. But, but, the, it, but it turned out, and why? Not only the solidarity, it turned out that the police in Ferguson were trained by the Israelis. That American police forces, maybe your police force, is trained by Israelis. I was certainly asked, you know, is the Troy Police Department being trained in Israel? Because Israel has programs of bringing thousands of law enforcement officers to Israel for training. Which is why the American Police Departments are not only militarizing, but they see you, they see you not as citizens to be protected, but as potential terrorists. You see? And, and it's changed the whole discourse. Israel says when the attacks happened in Brussels last month and in Paris, um, Israel says instead of criticizing us and our occupation, we're, you should be imitating us. We've developed a security state in Israel that's able to deal with terrorism in the way you can't. So forget democracy. I mean, democracy is a nice thing, you know, in, in a normal time. 1955, maybe. Forget democracy, forget human rights, forget liberalism. You should become a security state if you want to defend yourself. So it's a chilling message. Israel's basically saying, not only should you buy our arms and develop our techniques of repression that we've protected on Palestinians, but you should become Israelis. In other words, the world is divided that way. 
So the poor people, people of color, refugees, immigrants, marginalized people, we're in a church, sort of. I know it's not an active church, but we're in a church. Um, there's a theological concept that I think is the theological concept, and that's surplus humanity. How's that for a con? Corporations have basically categorized two-thirds of the world's population as surplus humanity. In the capitalist system, they'll never be educated. They'll never be productive in the sense that capitalism wants you to be productive. And the worst sin is they'll never be consumers. They'll buy you know, little food here and there and this and that, but they're never really consumers. So they're excluded. And, and in that kind of a system then, um, uh, and, and here's where I begin to put the book into a wider context, and that relates to today in a sense, into the wider context of capitalism. As capitalism in general, it's not just the elites of the world, as capitalism in general comes into crisis, there's huge income disparities. We know the 99%, 1%. But that's not, it's not even 1%. It's like one one tenth of one percent. <laughs> In fact, is, you know, Oxfam came out with a report. Look it up about a month ago, showing that one percent of the world's population controls fifty percent of the world's resources. And of course, the world's resources are getting scarcer and scarcer. And one of the issues is that the world's resources are largely the, the, the valuable resources are largely around a belt around the equator. So a lot of the most val valuable resources are under the feet of the poorest people of the world. So the question is, there's another bumper sticker that I remember from the old days. How did our oil get under their sand? <laughs> right, during the Iraq war, the first Iraq war. And that's exactly the equation. So as capitalism wants to begin to extract more and more and scarcer resources from the world under the feet of poor people, it's got to exclude. And, the, and poor people and anybody resists. You don't voluntarily get marginalized and impoverished and exploited. But so the trick is, how do we cast resistance as terrorism? You see, and you delegitimize any form of resistance. And of course, with capitalism as well, it's, it's unsustainable. You've got climate change today. So that as capitalism becomes more in crisis, it has to become more repressive. And so here is where Israel comes into play. Because there's a concept of generals. You know, my book is called War Against the People. But it comes from a concept that generals have of a new paradigm of war, which is called war amongst the people. That's what they talk about. And it turns out that you don't have wars anymore like we used to think about wars, World War II. You have armies, and you have sides, and they have battles, and you even have names for the wars, you know. You don't have that anymore. You have a few small localized interstate wars over the years, Iraq-Iran, 1973, Egypt and Israel maybe, uh, the Falkland War, that was a cute one, uh, you know, and so Vietnam in a sense, that was an asymmetrical war um, with Iraq, but basically interstate wars are a thing of the past. The new form of warfare is war amongst the people. Urban warfare, and for the first time in history, most of humanity lives in cities. So when we're talking about these resources, a lot of them are in urban areas. You have urban warfare and you have uh, counterinsurgency, asymmetrical warfare, all these sorts of, of, of words that we use for, um, for these kinds of wars against the people. Generals call them wars amongst the people. But if you put it within a political context, especially of capitalism, there are really wars against the people. And that's the irony, of course, is we mobilize people around the idea that the wars we're fighting are for us. 
Therefore, our defense, our security, patriotism, spreading democracy and freedom. I mean, I was on an airplane a few weeks ago, way, I don't know, from Detroit to somewhere. You know, we land, and, and they say on the airplane, let's give a round of applause to our warriors. You know, so the whole, you're, we're all being bullshitted, really. And not only, that, not only that, but the language, warriors. See, you don't talk about soldiers anymore because, because the military and sec homeland security and police have all started to come. They used to have a difference between the army and the police force. You don't have that anymore. Your police forces are being militarized into little armies, and your armies are being policified. They're going abroad to do nation building, regime change, uh, spreading freedom and democracy, not to win wars. So they're all coming together like that. And so you've got, uh, so, so you, in other words, you have this kind of a system uh, in, which, uh, in which the people, th these are wars against the people, whether they're wars abroad or wars at home, what I call securocratic wars. So, so the whole idea is that we have to have a security state. That security trumps everything. Trumps democracy, it trumps uh, uh, your, your civil liberties and so on. Uh, and so, you know, terms like warriors mean, why warriors? Because warriors would apply to, to police as well as to soldiers. You don't talk about battlefields anymore. It's an old kind where somehow there was a defined area where you had a battle. The armies today talk about battle space. And police forces use the same language. Troy is a battle space because the enemies and the, the subversives and the terrorists and all, they're all over the place. You see, they permeate, and therefore security has to permeate. So in all, and so you, and you think of the language we use, war on crime, war on drugs, war, in other words, we take domestic issues, especially of poor people, and we put them into a war uh, a metaphor. Um, so that, so that uh, these are wars against the people that we're living. It's come to the United States, and they're class wars. And that's something that we, we have to start, whether it's in the labor movement or the left in general, we have to start talking about class again. Because this stuff has to do with class, as well as race and, uh, and, 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 other, and gender and age and so on. But class is really at the basis. Because we're talking about a, a, a class that's controlling the world, not the, I mean, it's, there's an integration of class and race, obviously. But nevertheless, we, should, we have to talk more about class. And so what I'm saying is, and I, I, I'll, I'll end on this, I, I won't get into all of this. I go over the Israeli arsenal, because I use Israel as a vehicle, because Israel has developed weapons and security systems of wars against the people. I mean, one of the problems is in the United States, which is the top capitalist system, is you have an interest in wars against the people because you want the, the flow of resources to come to this country. The, Amer the United States is 4% of the world's population and uses 35% of the world's resources. Well, you don't do that without violence and exploitation. So, but at the same time, you're trapped because the weapon systems that you have in the Pentagon are expensive, sexy weapons that have no relation to wars anymore. The Pentagon, the F-35, the new cutting-edge stealth bomber, was an appropriate weapon for a war against the Soviet Union. It's useless in Syria. And a matter of fact, when, when, when Robert Gates was the Secretary of Defense, he wanted to cancel the F-35 which costs a trillion dollars to develop because it's a useless weapon. All these weapons of, of interstate wars are, are useless today. What do you need a nuclear submarine if you're fighting ISIS in, in, in a village in Syria? So that the United States 
But economically, you're built into that because your economy depends on arms. Why couldn't Gates cancel the F-35? Because every congressional district had a piece of it and its jobs. So here again, you know, the unions have really a message here. Not only do we protect jobs, but we should be active in retooling the economy so we don't have to produce these weapon systems in order to provide jobs for people. That's so what happens then is, in wars against the people, you outsource. Israel, that's had wars against the Palestinians for 100 years, has the weapons and the tactics and the systems to fight the kinds of wars that you want to fight, not the Pentagon. And so that's what gives Israel this in with, with powerful countries and not powerful countries in the global south as well because it develops weapons of repression that can be used by, um, <clears throat> that can be used by elites all over. And I try to show that, I, I won't get into it today, but uh, if you look for example at missile systems that Israel develops, they're all, you see, in all the websites, Israel has 500 companies. Israel, which is again the size of New Jersey, I keep coming back to that, has 500 companies that exports weapons, weapon systems, components of systems, and so on. What gives Israel the edge in the market? I mean, there's thousands of companies. It's a very competitive industry. They're combat proven. Combat proven. Who are they combat proven on, do you think? The Palestinians, of course. And so the Palestinians become the guinea pigs. And the answer, why doesn't Israel accept the two-state solution and give up the occupation, is because the occupation is a laboratory. Without this laboratory of four and a half million Palestinian guinea pigs to experiment on, like in Gaza, we're not going to have the edge in, the, in, in these markets. And I'm, one of the reasons why I'm writing about this and talking about this is a field I don't know anything about. What do I know about the military? I was never interested in it. I don't know policing. But I discovered not only does it have a tremendous role to play in the world, so if I'm on the left, I've got to know this stuff. But if you take the military, security, and policing together as one package, it's a two and a half trillion dollar a year industry. Well, I mean, that has to have some kind of global impact on people, on societies, on conflicts, on economies, and so on. And we don't know very much about it. I don't know very much about it. So that I'm using Israel as a vehicle for trying to understand these systems of control, cyber wars, and especially what Israel specializes in are what I call weapons of repression that are used directly on people to, uh, for, 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 for repression. I won't get into it. Satellites and surveillance, but drones, for example. Drones are, 40% of the world's drones are Israeli. And these are the perfect weapons of control because they do what humans can't do. They hover. They loiter. It's a term the military uses, is they loiter. They're overhead, you don't see them, you don't feel them. And they can hang there for days and weeks and months just tracing your patterns. And there are today more drones sold to police forces than there are to armies, including the American, American police. So drones become almost all, and then of course you can weaponize drones which changes the whole nature of warfare. Because what happens, warfare becomes hunting. You have drones that are so high, nobody can, I mean, certainly ISIS can't shoot them down, or the people of Pakistan, or the people of Ferguson, you know. So drones can survey you at will, and they can kill you. Targeted assassinations, which is illegal in international law, has become an accepted part of American policy. Obama sits down every Tuesday. Every Tuesday he sits down and there's a list, a priority list of who we have to kill in the world. 
and he approves this many people to be killed by drones every week. And there was a report put out by Jeremy Scahill about a month ago that 90% of the people killed by drones aren't the targeted ones. They're collateral damage. So these are tremendous weapons of repression, but drones aren't only big things. You know, you've got today nanotechnologies, microtechnologies, genetic tech. We have te there's technologies in the military that we don't know. Partly because they're in the in the, the world of hard science, and most of us don't come from that world. Most people on the left come from the social sciences, humanities, or they're workers. Um, but, uh, so we don't really know what these technologies of control and violence are. I mean, how's this for a drone? The size of a mosquito, and this is a poison, and these are cameras. You know, so <laughs> it could be buzzing around here without noise. Who would know? Even weaponizing insects has become a part of warfare today. So you don't know if the cockroach running, running <laughs> by the room is a drone or an actual cockroach. And getting into issues like uh, technologies like nanotechnologies. A nano is the size of a molecule. So you can take swarms of nanos that self-replicate, replicate, and you can take a nano particle, like a, a like a, a a particle, like like in dust, and you can you can uh, give it artificial intelligence, you can weaponize it, and you could target with nano dust. It's called smart dust. Entire populations. You could take the city of Troy and target particular parts of the brains of everybody in Troy. You can make the entire population of Troy forget, or laugh uncontrollably, or affect the nervous systems. These are the types of weapons that are being developed today, and even affect the DNA. They have DNA targeting nanobots that can be introduced into our bodies, and surveillance systems that are really, really totalizing. This is a, and this is an Israeli surveillance system that's becoming very popular in the United States as well. And it's interesting, what, what, when you talk about a security state, what's the greatest threat to a security state? It's exactly what you hold most dear. It's what, what's, called, what's called spaces of anonymity. Those are the biggest threats. The state is very anxious. If it doesn't know where you are, who you're talking to, who you're associating with, if you have spaces of, that, so what these systems promise through police forces and municipalities to buy them, is we'll eliminate spaces of anonymity. Everybody will be transparent, every interaction. And the CCV cameras that are coming in, the, the most of them in the world, the, the highest proportion are in the UK in Britain actually, but they're coming into here and they're digitalized. So don't think there's some policeman sitting in a room looking at, at hours and hours of footage. It's not the way it works. But there's, it, build, it builds databases of all of us. So it knows our names and it knows the biometrics. And why is Israel one of the leaders? You got 600 checkpoints in the West Bank. You get millions of Palestinians passing through all the time. It's a perfect laboratory. No wonder Israel is the world's leader in airport security or urban security and so on. So these, uh, you know, you have biometrics, you read eyes, you read faces, you recognize bodies. If you have a, uh, a nervous twitch or you have a limp or you've got something that's recorded, what distinguishes you. So you lay out patterns of behavior where you can begin to predict where people are going and what they're going to do before they know where they're going, before you know where you're going, because it predicts your patterns of behavior and eliminates spaces of anonymity. These are really, George, this is really 1984. The technology is here. And of course, the police. And I'll just end on this, but the police are obviously relevant. Um, so last month I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and they take me to Georgia State, where I gave a lecture, 
And I'm looking out the window, and right out the window, there's what's called the Gilly Center. G-I-L-E-E, -E, if you want to look it up on the internet. The Georgia uh, International, uh, uh, International Law Enforcement Exchange Center. It's a whole huge building funded by Israel. And you know who funds it? Home Depot. Home Depot is, is run by a, a Jewish guy named Marcus, who's super pro-Israel, and he funds a whole program of bringing thousands of American law enforcement officers, I'm talking about local people, not, not the military, to Israel to be trained, and to bring Israelis to this country to train. And a lot of it goes through this Gilly Center. Um, so if you look up, <laughs> I just looked up on the internet, now, they tried, the students and faculty at Georgia State, through their BDS campaigns, have tried for years to target the Gilly Center. It's a black hole. They can't, they don't know who teaches there. They don't know who studies there. They can't get any access to the curriculum. And this is a program on the campus of Georgia State. And it's replicated in other places as well. And so they bring American policemen here they're at the Israeli police headquarters. And, of course, Israel is also introducing arms into police forces. Because as police forces are getting militarized, the weapons are becoming similar. You see? So that, for example, this is a, a, a combination assault rifle, carbine, and submachine gun for law enforcement. Why a carbine? In other words, you can also do this like three rifles in one. Why a carbine? Because in America, because you can shoot deer with it, with a carbine. It's a normal rifle, that piece of it. And in American law, if it's a carbine, it can be sold publicly. In other words, if it's an assault rifle or machine gun, that's more difficult. But if it has a carbine component to it, it can be sold over the counter for about 1200 bucks but it's for law enforcement. Or for example, you all know the Uzi submachine gun. It's the most famous submachine gun in the world. But this is now for policemen. So you imagine, I mean look at this, it's a submachine gun that can be put in a holster. So imagine being pulled over by the side of the road by the Troy police, and they pull out a, an Uzi submachine gun on you. And not just some, or look what's happening, uh, and, and you know where, this, these are all products of a company called the Israel, uh, Israel uh, uh, Weapons Industry, IWI, that just opened a factory in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And they're working very hard to get these weapons into American police forces. So that, at any rate, all right, I won't go into all of this. This is, but, but part of what we're trying to do with the People Yes Network is to take all these local issues that we have, this is one, but there's a million other ones, and again, put them together into a, uh, into a kind of a coherent organization so that we can not only be aware of these programs, but that we can begin to do something about them because it's very important to organize. And we have to find in the 21st century new ways to organize. And I respect, and I, and I really, and I felt that today, I mean, certainly a part of the new high-tech 21st century organization with everything else is the music. <laughs> Without the music and the inspiration, uh, it's all technical. So I, I really think that has to be, that has to be a part of it. So I'll leave it at that. And we have a few minutes. <laughs> all right, now we're in a church. Our work is all political. And we're not supported by corporations, and we're not supported by governments. So I'm going to pass the basket. I'm not going to look. Here you can start. Just pass it around. But if you'd like to support our work, which I think is very important, I can get into it, but I won't get into it now, then we'd really appreciate that. So, um, I think that 
Careful what? Nobody's blaming, but don't forget capitalism is. I didn't feel like we did. Cap, okay, but capitalism is also people and I, actors. It isn't just the uh, abstract. That's right. That's right. But the word I use that I think is better, which is the word of international law, is accountability. We don't have to blame people. I'm not blaming anybody, but we do have to hold actors accountable. Israel can't be the fourth largest nuclear power in the world with a tremendous global reach militarily, including into this community, and an occupying power for 50 years and not be held accountable. And that's, that's really my message, is we have to define who the actors are and begin to hold them accountable. And human rights is one of the ways in which you can do that. <laughs> I've done my work. same response as the, as the labor movement in a sense, you know? I mean, I, that's not a new thing. When the Haymarket massacre happened, I mean, part of the idea was to intimidate and make people feel uh, uh, hopeless. Uh, and the answer is, and this is what I'm trying to, to do, the answer is to organize, but not just organize. Again, from my point of view, I, I don't believe in hope. I tell you, I, that's a religious term. Uh, I believe in struggle. I mean, corporations didn't hope to run our world. They planned it very well and they worked very hard. And, uh, and so I think we have to really be strategic in how we organize. So part of it is to, uh, I think we have to comprehend the capitalist world system because this is the source of the ills today. I mean, this is kind of the, the deep background to everything that, that, that that pulls things together. And I think the fact that the powers that be 
have really uh, inculcated in us, especially in young people, um, the small personal and have really uh, deflected their attention from the big picture, I think it's the teaching. And, uh, and I'm sure you, have, you, you can find that in the school system. You know, I mean, American kids are famous all over the world for not knowing geography. <laughs> well, that's not just uh, a certain failure. I think there's a, there's a, there's a built-in uh, structure in the curriculum. I mean, I'm not, I, don't, I don't believe in conspiracy theory. I mean, I'm not talking about some conspiracy of people that are, but I'm saying there's a logic to the system that leads you, even if you're a liberal person, into certain, I mean, look at Hillary Clinton. You know, she's, I'm sure, a nice, I don't know how nice she is, but she's liberal and everything else, but she's locked it, and it leads her into a particular place. We have to comprehend the whole system. We have to analyze what in the, it's really what you were saying. What's in the system that's the problem? What, analyze the problems we're facing. We have to formulate that alternative. I think that's where the Occupy movement failed. Because it resonated with people, but we weren't able to provide an alternative. Okay, you don't like capitalism. So what are you suggesting? Where are we going? And we haven't articulated that. Uh, the the post-capitalist, or the what I call a life-centric world system to replace the capitalist, this hasn't been articulated. We have to do that. And then we have to organize. And what I'm, the way, no. You're, not, you're never going to organize the left. We all know that. I know my people. <laughs> We're not going to organize the left. Forget it. But what I mean is, that's why I say provide an infrastructure. You provide an infrastructure of communications and, and meetings and networking and campaigns. And then you can, left groups can join, you know, if they want to voluntarily. Nobody's going to come and organize uh, the left, unfortunately. So I think this is what I'm, this would be my answer, is that uh, we have to be strategic in terms of uh, how would we go about fighting the system that exists today, but articulating and effectively fighting for a new system. You know, you know. Um, <laughs> but you will. We're in Rensselaer? Or where? Albany, Albany, Albany. 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 the Nano College. Ah, okay. Right, okay. That's right. Well, you become the watcher, and they co-opt you, and you're you're a part of the system. sense that, for example, most recently in, in England, to combat the Corbyn insurgency in the yeah, Labour Party, yeah, right. there's been one charge after another of anti-Semitism against his supporters, That's right. trying to throw him on the defensive. I mean, yes, we should be concerned about anti-Semitism, but we also have to understand that just as the, the Scots who fought the English were turned into the occupiers of Ireland, That's the Israelis right. have been turned into occupiers. That's right. And we have to look at the language, you know, because you can manipulate language. You know, anti-Semitism, who wants to be called an anti-Semite? We have a joke in Israel, by the way, that, uh, that an anti-Semite used to be someone who hates Jews. Today, an anti-Semite is anyone who Jews hate. <laughs> so, so, language is important. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, that's why human rights language that really hasn't come to the United States very much, you know, you don't use it like Europe and the rest of the world, is important because it cuts across that. When you talk about the rights of Palestinians, that doesn't, Im 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 that doesn't imply that you're blaming Israeli Jews. It means that you have rights, and everybody has rights, and you can be held accountable. So it bypasses all this us and them and either or kind of stuff. One of the words that's important, I think, is security. Because that's what you talk about how they get us into the system. The whole term security is a term that locks you into their logic. The minute you, because who doesn't want to be secure? There's no problem here, there's no issue. I want to be secure. But what if we, and that's what I try to do in the book, what if, we, what if we substituted the term pacification for security? All right, you want to be secure, fine. Do you want to be pacified? And that raises questions. Who's pacifying me? Now you talk about the nano center in Albany and so on. Who's pacifying me? Why are they pacifying me? Uh, how are they pacifying me? All of a sudden, all kinds of questions arise that don't arise when you use the word security. Security closes down all those kinds of questions. So even the language they use is a language that closes down the questioning. I mean, if you, what, you don't want security? Are you crazy? You don't want security? I'll tell you a cute, just, a, just in a second. When I was coming here just now from, from Tel Aviv, in Israel, they use ethnic profiling, racial profiling that is still illegal here, although Israel's trying very much to get the United States to change laws and to adopt that kind of, a, kind of an approach. But because Israel uses ethnic profiling, it doesn't have to use technology that much, because there's more interface, there's more face-to-face -face interaction, and so on. So in Israel, actually, you go through the airport much easier. I mean, not, not always if you're, if you fall within the parameters of, uh, of somebody that's suspicious, but, but in general. So, so for example, you don't, in Israel, you don't take off your shoes, you don't take off your belt, you don't take off your coat, and in, in most cases, you don't take your computer out of the bag. There's no reason, talk about instilling fear, there's no reason in the 21st century why you have to take your computer out of your bag. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, technologically, there's machines that can see through your computer case. But, they, but that's what, so I'm in line at the, at the x-ray machines, you know, going through, and there's an American tourist couple in front of me. And they're yelling at the Israeli security people. I want to take off my shoes. <laughs> yeah. How can I be safe on the airplane if I don't, and they're, they're forcing the Israelis to take their shoes. I mean, that's the degree to which we can be self-disciplined. You see, we become our own. So the powers that be can step back because they've made us our own, our own discipliners, our own, our own wardens, in a sense. And, and we buy into that. So it's a very sophisticated system, and, I, and it's not a conspiracy. I mean, I, I don't want in any way to imply there's some group of people thinking about this or plotting it. And there are powerful people, and there are ruling classes, and there are interests that we should know, uh, but we can't get mechanistic about it. We have to, we have to keep our, our political uh, analysis, but certainly all these mechanisms are mechanisms that are, are, that are used to control us. Maybe I'll take two more, and then I'll let you go. I don't know if it is actually. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I have Israeli, I have dual citizenship. I mean, I, you know, what's it called? Uh, revealing, no, what's it called? Revealing the truth or truth and, there's Dis a term. Disclosure? Or? Yeah, dis uh, full disclosure. I grew up in Minnesota, in northern Minnesota, actually. 
but I've been in Israel now for 40 some years. So I have Israeli citizenship. So Israel is a vibrant democracy if you're Jewish. I mean, it's as good as the United States. I don't have any problems. I can speak out, I can write. No, partly because I think uh, we're not seen on the left as being very effective. I think if we were more effective, there might be more pushback to, to what we do. Right now, I think we're off the radar. You know, when we're anti-Zionist, we're talking about living with, Palestine, with, living with Arabs, because we don't use the word Palestinians. Uh, a democratic state with Arabs, and it's not Jewish anymore. I mean, that's so nutty for most Israelis that they don't have to suppress us because we, they laugh us off, basically. And so, you know, uh, when we get to a point where we do begin to be more effective, then, I, then we can expect those kinds of uh, responses, I think. And last but not least. Um, well, maybe least. We'll, <laughs> we'll see. Least. Uh, first, I just want to say one minuscule thing. I thought I heard you say that USS 175 foreign military bases. Well, if you go to the Pentagon's website, they will admit to 680 foreign military bases. And I can give you names of some right. that are not on that list. No, what I meant was 174 countries oh, okay. I where, they, where there are I bases. 130, but yeah, I, I didn't quite get that. Um, That's a Chalmers, uh, uh, Johnson? Chalmers Johnson, yeah. right? It's about the 174 countries. Yeah. Um, bases. So, um, uh, I think you're right about the Congress and being very much pro-Israel and so forth, but I, I think there's a, a difference in the U.S. population today. Mm. Um, and I think the, some of the biggest demonstrations we've had in this country have been the ones around Gaza recently, where tens of thousands That's showed right. up in New York and, and by Chicago and, and other places. And I think that's changing. And I think that's the reason that Bernie Sanders didn't go to APEC. Yeah. It's because yeah. the people that support Bernie Sanders would, would have, not have been happy. Would have not been <laughs> happy. And I think that's something. But I do agree with what you're saying, that there's a difference today in how we have to organize. Back in the Vietnam days when we organized mass demonstrations, we tried to do that in the beginning of, of um, Iraq, and, Nick, and um, Bush came on and said, well, it's a focus group. Something yeah, has, yeah, had yeah. changed. That mass sentiment expressed in mass demonstrations was not going to do it, and we had to figure out other methods, which I think the left is trying to do right now. Yeah. And I think this has been a, a critical point. So all the stuff you said is great, and I'm glad you're trying to think this through, but, but what do we do um, yes, <laughs> with, yeah. when they can have this technology and so forth? That's right. And even in, with BDS, in this state alone and, and in many other states, they're trying to make BDS illegal. illegal. That's right. Um, That's right. So, what do we do? I know we need to. We, we all talk about intersectionality, That's connecting right. these dots, and connecting these issues. Um, but it has to be more than that. That's right. And so, what? How do we do that? Well, that's what. Uh, that's what I call. You know, that's what the idea of the People Yes Network is. Is what we have to do is to. I mean, I, I'm talking about creating this infrastructure. Because the groups exist. I mean, there's groups, you know, here. I mean, everywhere I go, I find wonderful people, committed, bright, you know, that, that know the issues and that know the history and the music. And, but, you know, everybody's isolated, in a sense. There's, it doesn't accumulate. There's no accumulation of, in other words, there's no synergy. You know, taking the energy from here and from from a million other places and somehow putting it together and harnessing it and making it into a movement. I mean, young people do talk about movements uh, that I think is also a, a piece of it. So my, my approach is to try to see, again, if we can develop a kind, that kind of an infrastructure, and I say infrastructure again, because we don't cooperate either. I mean, the left won't, you know, we, you know how fragmented we are. So, you know, if some group disagrees with us with a comma, we, you know, they're out of our, you know, we get so in, in grown in a sense. So the, uh, the infrastructure idea is how you can keep your identity, your analysis, your, 
your sphere of work, but you can cooperate with others. And I think, I think that's really what's missing. If you think about it, there is no infrastructure of the left in the world. I mean, there's a lot of networks, and then you get social networks, of course, and, and people do, and I think we do have a, 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 a certain uh, influence. I mean, people do come out for demonstrations. You do have the Occupy, but it's not sustainable, and it's not sustained. It's episodic, and we have to pool our analyses and our resources. One of the problems, one of the projects of the People Yes Network is what I call an institute of strategic activism. One of the problems is you've got in universities professors that really have concepts that are important. You want to talk about capitalism. I mean, you've got professors that have spent their lives studying capitalism. But they're not activists, many of them. Some of them are, but most activists aren't. So they, their concepts are confined to either the classroom or to academic journals. So the activists that are out in the street in the barricades aren't getting direction and, and help with political analysis because there's that disconnect between them and the university. And then it goes the other way around as well. And that is that the university people start to do research based on theory and, and colleagues and getting ahead in, in your career. And the real issues and questions that activists bring up uh, don't inform their research. That's where I, my book, I mean, I, I, I have to say, it's a good book. <laughs> and the reason, I, and I, I said to myself, how is it, it's gotten great reviews by military people as well as radical people. Why? I mean, I mean, there's a, a million, you go to Barnes and Noble, Military history is one of the biggest sections of the bookstore. There's thousands of books. But very, few, but very few people connect, like I try to do, the, uh, the, um, in a critical way, the analysis with, the, uh, with how it's done. So if you go in, you've got Chomsky and Nomi Klein and, and then a, a lot of other academics and, and intellectuals and so on that will talk about capitalism the capitalist system and violence, and they mention militarism, but they don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about it. What do I know about F-35s and military? You know, Naomi Klein is wonderful, but I would challenge her in terms of how much she really knows. She knows the military plays a role in policing, but that's not her field. And very few. And then you go to the other side of it, you've got all these people writing the books in Barnes and Noble, about guerrilla warfare and counterinsurgency and the history of the AK-47 and all the wonks that will tell you every nut and bolt of a rifle and, and every battle in history and all that stuff, but they're not critical. They're not asking questions. Why are we going to, that's the whole issue. There's this book, The Utility of Force, by a British general, Rupert Smith. He's the one that coined the phrase, war amongst the people. Well, for the military, it's a technical problem. They're not politicians. His issue is, how do I win a war? Well, I don't care what kind of war it is. That's not my job. My job is to win it. So it's war amongst the people. But if you have a political context to it, and you say a war just doesn't happen, there's obviously interest behind it. and So it's really war against the people. That's really what it is. And all of a sudden, you kind of link from a different angle, you know, you're, you know, what I try to do is know more about the military than Chomsky and Nomi, so I can talk about how the military, how capitalism enforces its hegemony on the one hand, but I, I can also I have a chapter how it's really done. What are the technologies that we don't really know? And I even apologize in my book, I'll, I'll warn you, that the whole middle section is very technical, because I think we have to know the language they use. What are their technologies? What, you know, they have all this fancy jargon, and we have to learn that language if we want to develop strategies of, of resistance. You can't resist effectively if you don't know what you're up against. So I think on, on those levels, and then finally, my last word is, in Israel, Palestine in particular, you know, when I said, you know, the Occupy movement failed, I think, because we didn't articulate 
where, to people, where should we be going? So, you know, people, it's easy to get people to be against capitalism, but where do you want me to go? I'm not going to invent a, a post-capitalist system on my own. I need a little bit of help in terms of show me where to go. It's the same with Israel-Palestine. We have today a BDS movement, which is very strong. Boycotts of Western sanctions, but it's not connected to an end game. So I've been traveling for 20 years now. People say to me, you know, I heard you already. Okay, I get it. I'm against the occupation. You know, Israel's doing terrible things. We support Palestinian rights. What do you want? I mean, I'm not going to sit. I'm not going to sit in Troy and invent the solution to the Palestinian issue. You have to tell me where to go. And we're not really doing that in Israel-Palestine. And that's part of also what I'm trying to get at. So one of the things I'm trying to do is just formulate an end game. And um, so I'm saying BDS for BDS. I'll leave you with that, with that slogan. I made up a slogan, so I might as well share it. We're not there yet, but this is where I think we should be going with this conflict. Boycott investment sanctions for a binational democratic state. And that links the, 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 the strategy with the end game. Um, so I think we have to do this in Israel-Palestine, but we have to do the same thing globally if we want people to, to go somewhere. I mean, they don't know where to go. And, um, and we're not very good at articulating. Where we, where we should be going, I think. So, I'll leave you, leave you with that. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Again, it was what, what I saw was wonderful, especially the music. Thank you for the basket.